We'll get started. I'm going to try to speak into the microphone or as, as close to it as possible. Um, that way, sometimes I'm on a little, I realize, and, and uh, mumbling doesn't carry through a microphone very well, or through, through the air very well. So um, hopefully this will help, help you guys here and help me to be here. Um, we, are, we are now week four together discussing the kingdom of God, and we're going to start today by continuing last week's uh, topic of the kingdom enemy, that uh, the kingdom of God has an enemy, or enemies, you could say. And we made it through the Old Testament, but we wanted to take our time because we were, we were taking on some questions like, why does God allow suffering, mm. or what? Uh, how are we to think about the wrath of God? War, uh, you were the judgment of God, and so we wanted to give some time to that. And uh, we're going to continue that into the New Testament. And so, here's a little review. Uh, we saw coming out of Genesis 3 that promise that the serpent will be judged by a seed of the woman, right? Genesis 3 15. Um, God says to the serpent that he will that this coming redeemer will crush your head, he will strike your head, he will bruise his heel. And so from that we see developing throughout scripture uh, the, these ideas that there, there is an enemy of God's kingdom, you can taste enemies, Satan, sin, and death, or the New Testament is going to talk about the world of flesh with devil, uh, which we'll come to the few weeks where we'll talk about spiritual warfare. We'll talk about the world of flesh and the devil and war. Um, we see from Genesis 3.15 that all people, all humanity, is divided up between those who uh, are waiting, in the Old Testament time, waiting for the promised Messiah, waiting for the Redeemer to come, and those who, it's, instead of aligning himself with God and his purposes in the world, they align themselves with the enemy and um, debate war against God and his people. And but we did see that promise uh, that one of Eve's offspring will defeat the serpent, will defeat evil, but he will be harmed. He will be uh, he will he will have to make a sacrifice. But well, for eight years, um, he will be marred as he says that something bad is going to happen to him, even as he deals with that blow to the serpent. So we saw that play out in the Old Testament. We watched it as, as the Lord uh, both had to judge to bring his, his good wrath against evil individuals as well as even evil nations at times. Even his own people as they, in a sense, wholesale turned idolatry and began to do things like sacrifice their children to idols and things like that. But let's turn to the New Testament, and, and we're going to see these things continue. <clears throat> we see that language of the, the enemies of God continue as well, that, that, that all of humanity, certainly we know Satan and demons are the enemies of God, but then we read of people who Jesus described to the Pharisees at one point, that you are of your father the devil, you are of his seed. They said, they were your dark father. No, if Abraham were your father, you'd believe in me because Abraham looked forward to my day and was glad, Jesus says. So Abraham times your father, you are of your father, the devil. Paul talks about us, even us who are now believers, that before we were following the prince who tower in the air. We were objects of wrath by nature. We were children of wrath. That's what we deserve. Uh, Timothy, Paul says to Timothy, so would have already strayed away out of shame. This is in the context of uh, Paul saying to Timothy, people, a time will come when people will not put up with sound teaching. They, they won't want to hear the word of God. They'll want to hear what their itching ears want to hear. They want to hear what pleases them, whatever affirms they, whatever they want. And some have already strayed out of state. We don't think about this very much. Uh, we live in the West and we, and we forget that there's an unseen world often. Uh, but we're guilty of 
going along with uh, maybe a naturalistic description of the world that we, that up the Serenga culture would describe, although more and more of the New Age and um, with the neo pagan kind of ritualism is becoming uh, the religion of our day. And we're going we're gonna to look at at uh, first and second John here in a little bit, but, but John is describing how there were people in the church and then they left and they began to teach that Jesus isn't from the Father, that Jesus didn't rise from the dead or he didn't come in the flesh. And John uh, two or three times says that is the spirit of the Antichrist that works through these people. Just said that we are meant to be filled with the Holy Spirit and, and the bearing fruit of the Spirit. And these are people who are they're not filled with the Spirit of God, but the Spirit of the Antichrist. In Tyler, we, we do get to Revelation and we find that there are people described not as the church of God or the body of Christ, but as the synagogue of Satan, those who um, are teaching contrary to, to God's promises, to his word. They are um, trying to fool and deceive God's people. And, uh, and so we, we sometimes think, oh, well, the God of the Old Testament, this is a very poor thinking. We sometimes think the God of the Old Testament is a God of wrath and God of the Testament is a dis- the God of love. But that we saw last week, and we're going to affirm again and again, God is love. And so, as we said last week, that God's wrath is what happens when he has love, it counters evil. If you are lying and you see evil, you enter the name. You judge it. You don't even work. You don't sweep it under the rug. You deal with it. And that's, that's what the loving God has been doing. That's what he will do. Um... And we see that, that that continues through the late test with the any who will call on the name of the Lord to be saved. Rahab, a, a Canaanite prostitute, being brought into the family line of the Messiah. Right? Not even the enemy, the, 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 the um, leader of the Assyrian army, of the Syrian army, not the Syrian army, he can be brought in to salvation. Um, Jonah sent to Nineveh. And uh, John didn't want to go. Why? Because he knew, how are you going to forget him? I just know it. And God did forget him. Because that's what God is like. Hey. But, not everyone will repent. Not everyone will trust. Return to God. They will stay in the camp of the enemy. That's what we see both in the Old and the New Testament. Well, let's move into the New Testament a little more. Um, Jesus is um, here in Matthew 12. He's, he's ministering. Oh, we read in, in verse 22, Then a demon oppressed man who was blind and mute was wrought to Jesus at a field door, so that the man swelled with saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Can this be the son of David? Right, that title, the son of David, the promised Messiah, the, the king who would come, the, uh, the seed of Eve, the, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the son of David. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, it is only by a miracle, Prince of Indians, that this man casts out the youths. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, we read, he said that in every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. So if Satan casts out Satan, it might just cast out an even with power of another demon. Uh, he is quite against himself. How will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by the Elspel, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God, and it is that I've cast out demons, then the kingdom of God is turned upon me. The kingdom is carried in, it's evidenced by kingdom enemies being dealt with being sent away. The works of the enemy are being destroyed. We know that's, we know the kingdom has come because the, the enemy of the kingdom is being pushed back. Wrongs are being made bright. How can someone enter a strong man's house and wonder his good unless he first finds the stronger? Jesus is safe for our peace and ministry time finding the strong man. 
so that I can plunder his house? Well, what would Jesus want to plunder from the enemy? Us? Yes. That's right. God isn't pleased that there are people who align themselves with the enemy. Jesus wants to bind the enemy so he can rescue us, so he can rescue people. When he first binds the strong man, then indeed he may plunder his house. Now, Jesus ministry, from Jesus is announcing the kingdom, bringing the kingdom. We're going to see in a few weeks that, that his mission is to rescue you, really. We even saw the last week at the end, we, we took a moment because we'd seen God righteously judging some of the nations in the Old Testament. And so I asked the question, well, does, is that what God wants? It is, does, is, it doesn't he, does he love the nations? Does he, is, he, is he hard to please? Does he not want to forgive? When we saw actually know the prophets declare a time when the Lord himself would come and he would bring in all the nations and so that Israel is my people, but Egypt is my, my inheritance. He said, Assyria will be my own. He, he, he says, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm after. I'm trying. It's, I, I've chosen Israel, but not just for Israel. I'm bringing all the peoples. I'm going to save all the nations. And so we see Jesus bringing that about. That's a kingdom uh, work. That is the kingdom mission. We are buying you a strong Mary. Jesus is so that he can go into his house. And that means now that um, certainly we will see humanity, we will see evil continue. Did you tell us before in what uh, passage? That's Matthew 12, uh, starting in verse 22. Go to verse 29. Okay. Sure. Um, we're, we're seeing that we're in a period of time though where we won't see another um, it, uh, until Jesus' return, we won't see God's people going in and taking the land by force. Right? That's, not, that's not the era we live in. In fact, even in the Old Testament, there were just a couple of those moments where for various specific reasons, God ordained that that would happen. And I read say it's the crusade spell. <laughs> the crusade, the crusade were widely misunderstood, but they still were valid. Yeah. There's a great book called um, God's Battalions by Rodney Stark. Um, the, the, the narrative we hear about the crusades today, which is typically the green Christians wanted to go and take the land from the the Jews and the Muslims in the Middle East, and they got rich and well, the Euphrates doing it, and brought boards of treasures back. That, that's a, that narrative is about 100 years old. Uh, that's not, not how anyone, that's, that's not what happened, and that's not how anyone taught or thought about the Crusades until uh, there was a, a French scholar in the Louis de that set, um, re-erupt history <laughs> to make that case, and, and it's become popular. And go pop their eyes. So that's a great book if you're interested in that. Um, but that means, so we, we, yeah, we're not invading Muslim cities. We're not trying to take gravel from uh, Buddhist peoples. Uh, the, the strong man has been bound, and it is a time to plunder, but not gold from the Middle East. You're going to see where we plunder by. Proclaiming Christ and seeing men and women move from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his beloved son, what the Bible says. And so our enemies aren't um, uh, e e Egyptian armies or, or Malachite armies or Chinese armies. Our enemies are not flesh and blood, but rulers, authorities, cosmic powers in his present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil and the heavenly places. There would be one more, you could call it a crusade or a spiritual battle that takes place in the timeline with God. Um, but actually, God's people won't, we won't swing a single sword, we won't shoot a single gun. The whole army is consumed when the rider of the white horse shows up and, it, and the, 
Revelation 19 says it, with a sword from his mouth, all his, all his enemies are struck down. He saw he was how powerful the fight in his word that it would be to the knee. Um, we are, therefore, not to take up the sword. And so, as Jesus told Peter there, um, and that's got nothing to do with pacifism and circular country and things like that, but as a, as a church, we don't go to war. Not a physical war. We, we engage in spiritual warfare. Let's um, look there at the end then, how these things kind of wrap up the story of God's enemy. We fast forward to the book of Revelation. This is Revelation 20, a chapter that's probably most famous because it mentions the word the millennium. Um, it doesn't say much about the millennium. It's, it's, it's all about the defeat of our enemy. And so when we, when we debate and wrestle over the millennium, uh, that's not something that John was trying to explain to us in, in uh, Revelation chapter 20. But this is what he shows us. I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil, and say, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit, and shut it, and sealed it over him, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. There are different debates over what's happening here, um, but I'm going to argue for, and um, not just the Presbyterian tradition, but um, a large portion of the Reformation tradition, so those of us that would point back to the Protestant Reformation, um, would say, this is the binding of the strong day that Jesus talked about that this isn't something that's going to happen way in the future, but actually this binding is what happened when Jesus came in and, and bound the strong man so that he could plunder people, or as the words here say, so that Satan would stop deceiving the nations. He'd stop gathering them together to make war against his people like he was doing, against God's people like he did. He was able to enter the Old Testament that we saw. It's it's complicated chapter, um, but I'm the, uh, I'm, I'm going to argue and that's that's what's happening there. I'm trying to share other views. Um, so you're you're saying that the first coming of Jesus, the, is... the very beginning of this chapter, is describing what Jesus did in his first coming. Okay. Um, and what you see in in Revelation, there's this kind of progress, and then a restart, progress, a restart, these cycles, and yeah, the, um, there's seven of them. And they each start with something to do with Jesus' first coming, but then it, it progresses to the end, to the very end. And so that's why it looks like, if you read the book of Revelation, that evil is defeated like six or seven times. Well, that's because you're hearing the same story in a sense, but in different ways with different emphases. Kind of like you talked about last week, camera one and camera two or different angles of the same scene. Um, go ahead and I see, I see another question on your face. Yeah, so a thousand years um, and it's been 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. So it's symbolic rather than yeah. time-based. Yeah. Yeah, but a lot of the, a lot of the numbers in Revelation um, are meant to be received symbolically, so seven are the uh, seven you stir out to can even take full minutes, for instance. Um, 144,000, and the words that, that, that you could build a whole cult around that in the room, 44,000 of the redeemed, Joe's witnesses have done that. Um, but as a multiple of 12, the tribes of Israel, 12 the scientists that the church combined together and then multiply by a thousand you have it which meant to um, most evangelical scholars would say point to all of the redeemed under the old covenant viewed under the new, new covenant so yeah then it would in this case it'd be a figurative thousand years a long period of time in which Satan is bound and the nations are being brought in 
But David's deception is still going on. Yeah, yeah. So this isn't uh, stopping all deception. Um, it's stopping a, I would argue, a particular type of deception where Satan could rally whole nations and armies against God's people. Because we're going to see in a minute, as soon as he's released, that's exactly what he does. He rallies all the nations together, one lens through him, to make war against God's people. Doing so like they saw the, with Haman wanting to rally people to the destruction of the Jews or the Amalekites last week. Sharon. I like your view. So you're saying this verse is John prophesying something that's already happened? I'm saying it's, um, this is a apocalyptic literature which is highly figurative. Parts of it are prophetic in that they are future pointing, parts of it are, are pointing backwards. Are they happy to be prophetic if it's already happened? I, then I would say this part isn't even prophetic. Not all of, not all apocalyptic, apocalyptic literature is future pointing. And so a lot of this is, but not all of it. Like, like telling that prophesying too. No, not about that. They are simple, not that they will be simple. Yeah, so, so prophecy, there's, there's two kinds of prophecy. There is, you could say, forth telling. So I'm telling what's, um, uh, so, sorry, let me start with foretelling. Foretelling, I mean, I'm telling you what will happen in the future. But most prophecy is actually the other kind, is it's forth telling, which is saying, this is what God has already said, what God has already done, and the judgment and his promise because of that. Um, so not, no, uh, none of the positions on this chapter believe that everything in the book of Revelation is in the future. Um, the, the kind of three or four main interpretations of the book of Revelation all agree that parts of it are past, and even parts of it when John first wrote it are pointing to things that happened in the past. They just debate over how much and what it starts. So... Maybe, uh, maybe in the spring we'll just do the whole, the, the book of Revelation, you know, or process. That way we can really dig in here. But maybe a uh, like spot or question on it. Yeah. I have confusion now. Uh, oh, I'm, you know, this, uh, I jumped over to my commentary, so you landed on this verse, and it speaks to simply this question you know, uh, is this figurative or is the devil? And definitely she said figurative. And then talks about both views. And then it goes even on work. I mean, bank must then have the day after each of the least squinting of it to me is this uh God may God that's just subjected with Asian uh what shall happen. So I did the English back when we farm at the angle a couple of weeks ago. Where's the creatures of time as far as we are seeing it right now, then everything. You could jump in to happen, jump in will happen, I know that gets complicated. Well then how did these last few years are outside of time? Uh, I mean, this is the first time when Bishet had to use Satan and bind him strong and is actually this, the verse, the black seed, but uh, my commentary where it said, the great chain to find the dragon in the bonds of state. So I'm holding this to word in a thousand years as you, it stated it for a long period of time when you're doing other states, said you will live up there, these others were like, John's all day, the bowed years, but it's popped with my houses, pop like these image here is it fit in regard to Saint to be in and see what Eddie and Joe the thousand years. Various this help you when that ends right the latest. I don't think of these saying where I hear you're in new gravity just yet. The mad earth up search, though the earth up search in the modic emblems and spiritual water in modern times and seriously we need to new he takes your question. There's still a lot of you in the world. I'm safe being related to you over at Town on 7 and 10, and actually, he, so to do interpretation content, you're right. It may need to take a lot more time than it. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think the idea of life is that the strong man is bound safe, then there's a new cut in here if it's for the church, is any you. And we have this limit about time. And when the heck lots of safe, and I think, well, we would with cold. Really love every release when you pack. Yeah, came from number three. They have strong enough to. And I think maybe that's how I'm going to hold for you going to be here. Yeah, and then let me just say um, there's great arguments 
for a literal thousand years this. And I've presented some of the, big, well, not much of the case yet, but, um, but I've just said there's a, there's a case for a figure as well. I'll, I'm, I'm happy for people and go, for, for now, this is what's talking about the enemy. Um, either we're saying he is bound to the noun while the house is being plundered, which is what I'm in case of, or in the future, he will be, and in that point, there will be a, uh, you might say, an even greater bringing in of the nations through that time. And uh, frankly, I think, I mean, the can't both be true and that these bound, but I would be surprised to see, even in the first case, a greater harvest towards the end. Because we do think that both the, both the progress of the gospel as well as the upsurge in resistance and their evil in the world they will correspond. Um, so let me let me get to the last uh, last couple of slides here on what will happen to our enemy. When a thousand years of ended, Satan will be released from his prison. He will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, God and Magog, to gather them to the battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. Now everyone would say that's future, so it's literal or figurative. This part future. And they marched up on the broad plain of the earth, surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. The fire came down from heaven and consumed them. The devil went to see the nations and throw you to the lake of fire. So I talked about different images of different events. And so actually chapter 19, the briar of the white horse list, a word from his mouth slays all of his enemies. Here it's described as fire coming down to heaven, consuming all of his enemies. And so you could read that and say, well, the Bible contradicts itself. Or you could say, well, the writer might say, fire come down in heaven and consume it. You know, that might be the word he speaks. But there, because it's apocalyptic, it's highly pictorial. It's, um, you know, if you read of horn, the word is hornets with the heads of sheep or with the heads of but with crowns and that are the size of uh, horses. And we're trying to figure out what does a hornet with a crown, and it's not a force of a can people are postulate, what if that's a helicopter and the crown is the, 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 the propeller and John just didn't know what a helicopter was. Um, I've heard there, I've heard. Yeah, yeah. And so, and, but it's, a, uh, it's apocalyptic. It's, it, the, the point isn't we need to find it it's kind of like a parable. We're not finding every little bitty bit has a unique meaning. It's the picture as a whole is communicating something to us. And uh, it's certainly, we can't all agree that whatever John is saying, it is amazing. I almost don't want to go down this rabbit trail, but I can't help it. I thought the little dick in our day and age almost makes us think it's the end of the world. Uh, but really, it's the end of the world that we know. And so it, I felt like we've been through multiple pop, 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 apocalyptic eras across human history. Yeah. Yeah. And I do feel like we are at apocalyptic times because the world is now and shifting so then in, in so many ways. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm using the apocalyptic in a technical sense in one way. I mean, the, the fact that it is about towards the end of the world or about the end of the world coincides with what you're saying. Um, there's a type of literature or genre um, in the Bible. So parts of Daniel, Ezekiel, Book of Revelation, a couple of other places, you have a style of writing that is unique. It's, it's so it, you wouldn't read it. It's kind of like um, if you were to read, if you had a song, where he thinks on Psalm 23, Lord is my shepherd, right next to um, Exodus 20 and the Two Commandments. Those are, one of those is legal, it's a type of writing that is a communicating law. The other is, what's a song on it's, it's poetry, it's meant to be sung. And so to read Exodus 20 the same way I read a song. I read them both as the word of God. 
I read them both to be understood and obeyed. Um, but one of them is the Lord engaging my heart and wooing out worship for my good shepherd. The other one is to look at the holy God, look at what it looks like to get into this kingdom. These are the names. This is a good civil behavior, you can say. And so they you know, read all types of the Bible exactly the same. And apocalyptic literature is, uh, outside the Bible, there were people writing apocalyptic literature. So it's a genre that, that was known. Um, I should have this. Yeah, and it comes. And so it, it literally means unveiling apocalyptic, uh, apocalypsis, the, the revelation. Well, that's what we get that name. It's, un, it's helping, it's pulling back a curtain for us to see, but seeing in most living parables. Um, I will, I've got some great resources if someone wants to explore part of the literature or explore the book of Revelation, happy to point to. Um, I want us to notice here, here as we go, how um, the devil who had deceived the nations was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur. When the beast and the false prophet were, they'll be tormented day and on forever and ever. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. And uh, el elsewhere, death is called the last enemy. Well, the last enemy. The last enemy that be destroying is death. So the death of Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not powered, then the little cloth, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Um, there is a, there is an enemy. There are enemies to our king. And when we were adopted into God's family, or if you want to use it, other language to you, when we were brought into his kingdom, that, that means we were also brought into a kingdom that has an enemy. And we, so we have an enemy. So in a few weeks, we'll talk about spiritual warfare. And what it looks like to, um, you have to, to wage war in, in Jesus' name, not as crusaders in the Middle East, um, but as prayer warriors and evangelists and throughout the world today. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'm going to stop there. We're at 12.34 by 9 o'clock. Um, and I'm going to, you in any other, i to pull up another to pull up our next lesson, so that's kind of finished one week. Uh, any, any other questions? If it's if, if you have more questions about Revelation than apocalyptic, I'd love to talk to you after. Thank <laughs> you, John. <laughs> so wait till you me. Um, maybe I, yeah. But about uh, our enemies and and uh, We'll wrap up that lesson, which figures the fears of the enemy and one of the new life. Okay, well, then uh, let's, let's jump in uh, to this next question. When will the kingdom come? When will the kingdom come? So this might interact a little bit with our Revelation conversation. Uh, but I want to remind us of a passage that we looked at a couple weeks ago where Jacob is talking to his son. This is Genesis 49, starting in verse 3. And Jacob called his sons together and said, Snow yourselves oh. and around me so I can tell you what is going to happen to you in the last days. Uh, the last days, that's a technical trait in the Bible. It's sometimes translated latter days. This is sometimes even translated in days to come. I don't think that's the best translation. It's literally in the last days or the latter days. Uh, so days to come make it sound like, well, maybe in 40 years from now, or maybe 10 weeks from now. Um, but the point is what we're about to read is prophecy. And Stanley is prophesying about the last days. And he says to Jesus that we saw he helped him say to Judah, your brothers will praise you, Judah. Your hand will be at the throat of your enemies, and your father's children will bow down to you. Judah is a lion cub. My son, you have gone up from the prey, crouches like a lion, and lies down like a lioness. Who dare rouse him? The scepter, right, the kingdom, will never part from Judah, nor bring your staff from between his feet, until the one comes who abounds them both, 
and they have to belong in the allegiance of the nations. So uh, as, as we go, start paying attention to what, what is God promising in the last days? What all is going to happen? So promise number one, a kingdom will come. The Savior's seed, the one who will destroy the enemy, he's a king and he, he's going to come in the last days. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit ahead now to they're in the land. We, we read a couple weeks ago about that promise that Judah went to David. So one of David's offspring would be the king, would be the Savior's seed. Um, but then they're, they're thrown out of the land, they're kicked out of the land. And we see the prophets at this point really take up the theme of kingship. And they have really two emphases. One of those emphases we'll look at today, which is um, the restoration of Israel, or you could say the coming of the kingdom. The restoration of the kingdom will happen in the last days. It was said before already, we saw, but it picks up steam. More and more and more prophets are talking about the latter days coming of the king. So here, here's just a few of those in Hosea 3. Um, let's keep paying attention to what will happen in the last days. The children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or priest, without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household gods. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they shall come in fear to the Lord and to his goodness when in the latter days that they will be restored. So we see the promise of king again. We also see the problem about the sort of the promise of King and again, the promise of a return to the Lord. We can say revival. There might be language to use now. Um, they will come back to the Lord. They'll bring them back to Him. Jeremiah 23 says, "Behold, the days are coming," and this is a way that um, Jeremiah especially points to the latter days. He uses this phrase: "The days are coming." And we know he's talking about the last days because the things that he says will happen in the days that are coming are these same promises. So the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely. In his days, Judah will be saved. So in the last days, the king will come and he will save. He will save those people. And will too is probably the, the most famous Old Testament passage about the, the timing of God's kingdom. Um, Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they've been taken to Babylon. And in this, in, the, in Daniel 2, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. Do you remember the dream? There's this statue, right? And it's got a head of gold, kind of a torso of silver, kind of midsection of bronze, and then iron and legs and then the feet are a mix of iron and clay and he's had that dream and he doesn't know what it means and none of his wise men knows what it means and so he threatens to kill them all until Daniel receives an interpretation from the Lord and so Daniel says to King Nebuchadnezzar God has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days you are the head of gold so that's that's Babylon you are the head of gold Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you. And yet a third kingdom of Bromers will show, which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron. And as you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. And in the days of those kings, in the days of that divided kingdom, that those there's first, second, third, fourth, and then that fourth one starts to be divided up. In the days of those kings, that is, in the latter days, the God of heaven has set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall a kingdom be left to another people. He shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. In the latter days, God's kingdom will come, and he will defeat all the kingdoms of the spirit. It'll set up a kingdom in the lands forever. Here's a great picture of, of, uh, of that dream. I think it's pretty. The third. Look. And here's what history tells us after this prophecy. Let's see if I can try to talk into the mic, but see the picture of a monk. 
After this prophecy, Babylon is defeated by Persia. And uh, until 331 BC, Persia is the, the ruling kingdom until they're defeated by Greeks under, I believe, Alexander the Great. And it is, he, he, Alexander the Great thought he conquered the whole world. I mean, he says that there's, there's uh, stories that come sitting down after his last battle and leaving because there's no one in the city of deep. Um, Greece's empire covering the known world, and then uh, being defeated by Rome. And well, probably we know becomes a divided kingdom in, in, in several ways, um, but is broken into three eventually. And when Jesus comes, you don't, well, he's born in the days of Caesar Augustus, friend. And then what happens after Augustus's rule and reign? For a time, there's a bit of a division in the, the Roman Empire. And we believe, <laughs> and the New Testament says that Jesus and his game, he sets up, is, is the fulfillment of this promise from Daniel 2. Um, during the days of those kings, See, and um, God's kingdom is set up in the last days. So, uh, maybe just a couple, one more here. Jeremiah heard it, when behold, the days are coming, it declares the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I'll write it on their hearts. I'll be their God, and they should be my people. For I will forgive their men, but I will remember their sin no more. And so what will happen in the last days or the latter days? We know that the Spirit of God will be given. The promise of the Spirit. When you see the Spirit coming in the book of Acts, that, should, that bell should be going, oh my goodness, that's the fulfillment of the latter day prophecy of the, of the giving of the Spirit of God. The Messiah, David, will come. The temple will be rebuilt. God will cleanse his people. God will defeat and judge his enemies. God will gather Israel back. God will gather the nations to himself. Worldwide peace and prosperity. All these things are promises of the latter days. Now, you may be looking there and thinking, well, some of those haven't happened yet, and some of them have. And so that, that's where we get into the timing of the kingdom that, um, that Paul calls it a mystery. This is a mystery, brothers. He says, in few places, the mystery of the kingdom. So let's look at, at that mystery. You know, I'd like to bring up the mystery this way. John the Baptist was in prison and he heard what Jesus was doing. He said a word about his disciples and said to them, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? Now, Job had already pointed to Jesus and said, look, it's the land of God who takes away the sins of the world, brother. Uh, I must become less, he must become more. But here he is asking, are you the one who's come? Why do you think he's asking that question? Maybe because um, they really expected military in, in action. And it's, yeah. I, I'm in prison. I'm, <laughs> I'm in prison. You're supposed to be our enemies. What's going on? Uh, something, you know. Why haven't you defeated and judged wrong and, 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 and the Gentiles and whoever else is thought to be an enemy at this time? Um, why am I in prison? You're supposed to set the captives free, right? And so John had a picture of, I don't like um, end times timelines. This is about as complex as I get. Um, had this picture of the way God's kingdom would come uh, and as if you have this present evil age that's going on. So since Genesis 3 in the fall, this period of time was called the present evil age. And then the Old Testament says, but one day, the day of the Lord would come. The Messiah would come. Judgment would come. We, we read some of these promises, right? Of all these things that would happen on the day of the Lord. And at that point, this present evil age is gone. And the age to come begins. 
Right? It makes sense. We've looked at these passages together. This present evil age should end. Our enemy should be defeated. Our sins should be forgiven. When the Messiah comes, the praise the day of the Lord, and the age to come should start. And so it's natural that John would ask that, but Jesus says, Go and tell John of you here and see the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor has good news preached to them. The blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Jesus is saying, um, the promises have begun. The promises have begun. Good news is preached to the poor. I am showing that I have power over death, I'm raising the dead, over sickness, over Satan, I'm casting out demons. Go, which tell them what you see, that in the kingdom is coming. But, The timeline for all of Scripture looks more like this. That the Messiah comes once, comes the first time, to begin a period of times that we've been reading about called the last days. He is starting the last days. And during these last days, you have an overlap. This present evil age continues. And the age to come has also already started. So Jesus can show up and say, the kingdom is in Athen. If I'm casting out the myth by the, by the Holy Spirit, then the kingdom is in your midst, right? The kingdom is broken in, but it's an overlap of the ancients. That's why he's still dying. But that's also why we still today, in different places, see the dead like these. We, we still get sick, but we still pray and are healed. There's still demonic activity. There's still temptation and sin, but we have been, those who hear the gospel and believe, are born again to a living hope. There's an overlap of the ages. And that period of overlap is called the last days. Think back to the, to the Old Testament again. And we read mostly the promises of the good things that are going to come. But maybe think of a a passage like Isaiah 53. Anyone familiar with Isaiah 53? There, the Messiah is called the servant of the Lord. Do you remember what Isaiah said will happen to the servant of the Lord in Isaiah 53? I should put this in a slide. He assigned it. He will truly in King I. The Ethiopian eunuch this reading in Isaiah 53 when Philip was sent out to the desert. Isaiah 10 to 3, starting in verse 1, says, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he, and so in this section, he's talking about the servant of the Lord, the, the rescuer. He grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire in him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men to hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. With his wounds, we are healed. Several more verses we go on to read that somehow this king, this David, this redeemer, this, this one who was going to defeat all of our enemies, he suffers and dies. And we're reminded maybe of Genesis 3 where we read that the seed of Eve will crush the head of the servant, that he's going to be struck down as well. And so we see the Old Testament, you can actually see this in Zechariah, chapters 13 and 14, just right back to back in, in uh, I may have a map, which I think it's chapter 13, we read that the shepherd will be struck and the sheep will scatter. So you read of the judgment on down shepherd who would come. And then in the very next speech, flip the page and, and Zechariah doesn't write, but he rises from the dead on the third day. He doesn't, he doesn't say that. Instead, he just says, the king now rules. He's reigning all the nations. 
He is king. He's a figure of his enemies. And so, two, back to back chapters, he's done and be struck. He's not a rainbow. And so we see that throughout the Old Testament. We see it in pictures. By Genesis 3, we see it in prophecy. And, um, and that explains why the two comes. It explains um, for us a little bit of the life stage. We'll look at that in morning minutes. But um, Hebrews says it this way. Hebrews chapter 9. As it is, Jesus appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So he's appeared the first time to put away sin. And just as it is, is it a, as it is appointed from a man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bury the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to die for us, not to deal with sin, he's already done that, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. First time he comes to die, that's the suffering servant, that's the, I'm laying down my life for the sheep. I'm, I'm healing you of your iniquities. You might call it internal restoration. But his second coming will be external when he will defeat not just our internal enemies of sin, right? We now have victory over the enemy, Satan. He tempts us, he ties us, sure, but we end up we have the victory, but the external victory will be secure as well after the second coming. So Peter can say at the, on the day of Pentecost that this is fulfillment of the, of the prophecy of the Spirit being given in the last days because I'm making a case that the last days started with Jesus with his first coming, right? And so Peter says, in these last days, this is what you're seeing. Paul said, he's telling, he's talking about the book of Exodus, and he says, those things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction, by us on whom the end of the ages has come. Hebrews puts it this way, long ago and many times and in many ways God swept to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son. John doesn't call it the last days, he uses this phrase, the last hour. It's the last hour. You heard that the Antichrist is coming, so now many antichrists have already come. Therefore, we know it is the last power. We are living in the last days. Jim, we see you in the atomic clock. Yeah, we just talked about men's hours at midnight. We know in fact that our people right now is a levitation. He, no. Is this the same? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and so what that means, then, if you've got that timeline in your head, there's a, a, a German scholar named Oscar Kohlmann who used the, the picture of World War II. I may have shared this last spring when we talked about Keith a little bit, but um, so I'm going to look this to you again, and I'll try to speak loudly. So he said that Christ's first coming was like the day in World War II. Right, we knew that if we could just take Mormony and Omaha Beach, we would win the battle. If we'd win the war, we'd have another front against the, the Axis powers. Um, there would still be the Battle of the Bulge. There would still be the, 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 that violent bloody battle for Berlin. There'd be a lot of fighting left to do, but we knew on D-Day if we can take the beach and then pour one and a half million soldiers onto it and how many tons and tons of machinery. We knew we would win. We didn't know how long the battle would go, though the war would, would continue, but we knew we would win. And so that's how Jesus first coming. His death, his resurrection, his ascension has, has won at the battle. He has guaranteed the win. But there's still fighting that is left to do here in between his first and second coming. This is the overlap of the ages, the last days, and he will come again. And Colon compared that to VE Day, Victory in Europe Day, when the fighting was over. Now, D Day, that's, the war was decided, but there was a lot of fighting left to do. VE Day, the fighting's over. The, the, the war is won. There's 
true peace, at least when Jesus, I mean, the, the metaphor can only go so far. But that's the picture. First coming D-Day, we, we, we take it, uh, we, we've established a reach head in the kingdom of darkness. And now in the the of life, the ages, we're taking ground, we're taking ground, we're taking ground. Uh, we're being buffeted, we're being attacked. It's hard slogging sometimes, but, but we know we win. And when Jesus comes back, it will be not just guaranteed, it will be consummated. It will be finished. And so this present evil age has been invaded by the age to come of God's kingdom. We do today. Let's have um, just two more, two more slides and we'll, we'll be done for today. So I've, I've been making the case that we are in the last days, that Jesus' first trimming started the last days. His second coming will finish the last days. This period of time called the latter days or the last days. Um, in that mission that we'll talk about in a few weeks, the disciples came to Jesus in Matthew 24 and they say, when will be the start of your coming and the end of the age? When will this present evil age be done away with? And Jesus answers, um, they spend his two verses saying, well, there's becoming war, river of war, famine, pestilence, horrible things will happen, but that's just the way of the world. He says those are birth pains. Those aren't the sign of the end. That's just what's going to be lowly until the end. And he gets to verse 14. It says this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. If I battle the strong man and I want to plunder his house of people, then I have to have this period of time where the people can hear the good news. And I can save them. I can rescue them. Right? It's this latter day. is this, this period for plunder. This moment for mercy. Whatever you want to call it. This time period where Jesus is delaying his return. So that he can redeem the nations. And once that's done. Then the end will come. That's what Jesus is working in there. That's, what, that's why the church has a mission. That we're supposed to be about. Let's read about the last day. So we're in the last days. There will be a last day, though. There will be a final day. We looked at this a little bit, but I want to read it from a different angle. The devil who deceived the nations was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then death and Hades will throw into the lake of fire. If anyone's one's made was not written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. It's some, for some reason, the lake's slide is missing, but it goes on to say that in the new heavens and the new earth, there is no sun because the land and God are the light and we spend all of eternity in the light of God. It's almost, there will be a day of the Lord, this great terrible day of judgment here. But you could almost say there's a, another day, an eternal day where God uh, and his people and together, every tear has been wiped away from him. Yeah. The light is one. He saved us. We get to be with him. For having new heavens and the earth, having all sorts of wonderful, glorious adventures that come in an entire in those days. If you can call them days, and bless them. The light's always shamadi. The art. So, um, I'm going to hang around for a few minutes if anyone wants to talk about the, the timing of the last days and the timing of the kingdom. It's another way to put that. Jesus came and said that the kingdom is, is in your midst. Here in his lighter days, the kingdom is better than on your age. Uh, someday he will come in and consummate the kingdom. That's what the way the film working for. So, uh, you are dismissed. Um, can I ask if you're willing? Can I, I just I've shared my email a few times. Could I ask how this is going? I've not been a part of Monday school before, and so I don't know like you're used to them. I know what I how how I typically teach things, but it may not work for you. And so if I need to change what I'm doing to better serve you, please let me know. Um,
my feelings will not be hurt, I promise. Um, but I'd love to make this as beneficial, as helpful as I can for you. So I'll, I'll stop talking now. Thank you.